join me in welcoming Aaron to the stage. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be here in, in Berlin, uh, sharing some of my uh, experiences developing uh, entertainment applications in, in mixed reality. Uh, before I, I started Rabbix, I worked at some other interesting places. I started in VR uh, working at the Human Interface Technology Lab at the University of Washington. And then I went on to Walt Disney Imagineering to work in the virtual reality studio. Then I went to Sony Development to work in the Entertainment Technology Group. And uh, then I worked at some traditional video game companies and, and publishers before going on to create my own things. And when I started working in virtual reality, the um, technology wasn't quite there to do the sort of mixed reality applications that I was dreaming about doing. So back in 1991, we had uh, big bulky head-mounted displays and, and some augmented reality things that we could play with, but, uh, but it wasn't quite there yet. But what I did do is work on things like the Green Space Project. My advisor there, uh, Dr. Tom Furness, is pictured. We actually took people's uh, picture before they would get into this um, system, before they put on the HMD, so that as they were speaking, we could switch the pictures based on the phonemes that they were speaking. So it's a very crude thing to do, but it, it was, it was uh, very effective at getting more of an emotional experience in a telepresence kind of environment in the 90s. And then at Disney, we put people on a magic carpet and allowed people to fly through uh, imaginary worlds from a Disney movie, which was a lot of fun. And emotion simulators at Sony. And then more recently, as uh, entertainment has started to embrace virtual reality again, I've been able to uh, start working on some serious VR applications, uh, working with the emblematic group. Uh, we recreated some city streets uh, in Syria uh, in order to put people in a, in a very uh, impactful experience within virtual reality where you can see the, the city around you and then bad things happen. And also some fun things like this um, uh, Smash VR where we're fighting monsters. But today I'm gonna be talking specifically about mixed reality. And when I'm talking about mixed reality, as a lot of you know, that's a wide range of things. But when I talk about it, I don't really mean uh, Pokemon Go, and I don't mean the void, but I mean the thing right in the middle. And that's when we really start to mix virtual objects and virtual characters with the real world. And I think that's a really interesting space, but it does require a sort of spatial awareness. And these examples taken from Tango, spatial awareness includes three major elements. We need to have some ability to motion track, we need to have some ability to do some depth sensing, and we need some ability to remember where we are and where we've been. So putting those things together and then thinking about some higher order uh, implications of spatial awareness, we need to start to do surface reconstruction so we can build these walls back from, from what we see in a 3D environment and start to do plane detection and void detection or the empty space detection so that we know where we can put those virtual characters and virtual objects that we're gonna wanna interact with. Now there's some devices, fortunately, that do these things. Uh, Intel has been making the RealSense sensors for quite a while, and these continue to advance, and they've been very useful. Occipital makes the structure sensor that you can connect to an iOS device, like an iPad or an iPhone, and get some of these spatial awareness capabilities. But today I'm specific, specifically going to be talking about Microsoft HoloLens and Tango. So first, HoloLens. Until recently, HoloLens was only available in the United States and Canada. But just last week, Microsoft announced that they're starting to ship to Australia, France, here in Germany, Ireland, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. So in a, in a lot more places around the world, we can start getting these devices and playing around with them. And it is a pretty amazing device. It really is a wearable Windows 10 PC. And that's very powerful because you don't just have this uh, mobile device, but you've got everything that you could have from a desktop computer, but it's on your head. And you can see through it, it's got a transparent display. We can start to overlay what Microsoft likes to call holograms. And we also have these uh, spatial awareness capabilities starting with the infrared cameras. We can start to uh, build a representation of the world around us. And that's, uh, that's very useful. Now the first thing that Microsoft does is actually generate a very high resolution mesh based on a point cloud from what they're seeing from those infrared cameras, and then they down-res it to something that's a little bit more manageable for us to use. There's also motion and gesture tracking capabilities built in. So we track our head, both where we are physically and which direction we're looking, but then we also can have two hands. 
We know the position of those hands and we can get very, very simple gestures. Now for developers, it's very convenient to develop for this platform because it is just Windows. So we can use Visual Studio, we can use things like Unity, all those sort of normal Windows development tools that we'd use. You can get a lot of information uh, via Wi-Fi, there's a REST API so you can query all sorts of data about where the device is and, and get diagnostics from it, download uh, maps and things. But if you want to move quickly, you can connect over USB. So it's a very flexible environment. And Microsoft has also made a lot of convenient toolkit uh, applications available through GitHub. So they give us uh, scripts and libraries like the spatial mapping library that starts to um, make it very easy to build applications. And just a few weeks ago, uh, they released something called the spatial processing script library. And that goes a little bit further. It gives us some of the higher order things about detecting planes and surfaces and tables and understanding the empty space. So it's getting easier and easier to develop these applications. Earlier this year, uh, my development partner, Cyrus Slum and I uh, formed a little team called Cyron and developed an application for uh, a hackathon in San Francisco and, uh, and won a prize in, in that, which was fun. What we wanted to do with that is, is give people the ability to experience epic uh, cinematic experiences no matter where they happen to be. Every environment is different. We wanted to uh, be able to adapt to that. And then discover what we imagine is beyond these walls, perhaps scary things lurking out there. And then give people the ability to explore their space inside so that they can find resources that they can use in this, uh, in this ex experience, this adventure. So I'm going to show a little video of that. Now in this example, we happen to have the TV on. This is captured through the HoloLens. There happens to be a monster movie. But we'd like to see what we can do going beyond the 2D experience of monsters. And since we've mapped the walls, we can understand where the ceiling is, we can start to break through. So now we're beginning to see the uh, glimpses of that creature outside who's smashing through our walls. And no matter where we look, we're tracking and, and it's keeping track of where we are, but it's also prompting us now that we need to explore our environment, look around the space. And we decided in this case that we're going to hide things in the corners, in the sort of nooks and crannies in your environment to encourage people to really explore around and their entire space. There they can find these resources, in this case they're these little bugs, these fire bugs give people the ability to shoot back at this uh, beast that's attacking us. Before he destroys all of our artwork. So that's just a glimpse of, of the, the kinds of things that we can do when we blend these real world and virtual objects in the same space. We started experimenting with this uh, about a year ago with Tango um, before even getting our hands on the HoloLens. And that was uh, Google's uh, entry into this uh, sort of spatial awareness uh, category. And unlike the HoloLens, which is $3,000 for a developer to get their hands on it, the development kits were selling for $512, and very soon they're releasing a consumer device. So the Lenovo Fab 2 Pro is going to be coming out with the same uh, spatial awareness capability, a depth camera, a wide angle camera in order to do motion tracking in a, in a consumer package for about $500. And so this is the first consumer device that's really going out that has these capabilities. And it is in a headset, uh, which is, would have been nice, but it is convenient to be able to carry around a, ta a tablet or a phablet in this case. And it is um, a very powerful device. And again, the development environment for uh, developers is very easy. It's an Android device, so we can use um, Unity, we can use Java, and there's a UX framework that makes it easy to deal with some of the issues that come up when you have these kinds of devices. So for example, if there's not enough light, the uh, visual inertial odometry that we use for, for SLAM, for tracking, uh, doesn't work. So then this can prompt the user without the developer having to worry about that. Or if, there's, if you're too close to a wall, it can lose tracking, things like that. So it can help with that, and there's a very active development community and code shared so that we can um, make use of that and get up and running very quickly. So last year, we uh, developed an application called Ghostly Mansion that won a contest with, uh, with Google. And uh, what that was is a 
story-driven physical hidden object game. And what I mean by that is we took the hidden object genre, which is a very well-known and well-understood genre, that usually has people tapping around or clicking on the, the screen on a PC, but instead made that something where you have to get up and actually move around your physical room. So it was a very motion tracking driven design from the, from the beginning, that uh, if you wanna pick up an object, you, you physically have to walk over and reach down and, and pick it up with the tablet. And even for the level select, we give you an array of doors when you're returning to the game, and to choose which door you wanna go through, you don't tap it, you instead walk towards that door and walk through it. And we found that this, this sort of uh, natural motion is, is ideal for these kinds of interfaces as one of the other speakers mentioned today. But it's also possible to do mixed reality with Tango. And at Google I.O. they showed how they could semi-obscure this cat behind the podium. And we've, um, we've been experimenting with that as well. My partner Cyrus was just in Shenzhen last week at a, at a hackathon experimenting with uh, voxelized environment retheming. So we take the environment that we get back, the, the dense mesh, and we um, then turn that into a set of voxels, we understand where the space is, and we can replace the door, we can replace the walls with things that look more like a ghostly mansion kind of environment. So instead of just being in a purely virtual environment, we could take this space and retheme it to be that ghostly mansion and adjust and reflow that, that game experience. And that's really exciting. Mixed reality user experience is really about embracing that 3D space that you're in and prioritizing motion UI, so you're up, up and moving around, and not tapping on the screen, not going through menus, any, any of that that can be avoided makes for a better uh, mixed reality experience. 3D audio is really critical. It was hard to hear the audio there before, but that monster creeping through, you can hear which direction it's coming from, and that really increases the sense of presence, and even if you were playing on a tablet, having that sounds get louder as you get closer and being directional is really important. And also reflowing to the environment is an important aspect. And what we mean by that is because every environment is different, we need to use a sort of light AI or a, um, a CSS, to borrow from the web, if you will, for mixed reality. So we understand where the empty spaces are, we understand where the walls are, and then our game can have a set of rules that says these objects should be placed in these relationships to each other, and they just flow based on the environment that we're in. So I'm excited. Because the future of mixed reality is really now. We don't have to wait anymore. And so we can develop using devices like HoloLens and Tango for all of these other future devices that are either just now releasing or coming soon. Things like the ODG smart glasses, the R7 already out, but their new glasses actually have a, a modular system so you can add a depth sensor or other tracking devices and get a more mixed reality experience out of your glasses. Occipital released the structure sensor VR or mixed reality dev kit, which allows you to have inside out tracking and uh, really move around through a space while in a VR experience or in a mixed reality experience with an iPhone. And Apple has been teasing us with their patent applications, and, uh, but they've also been releasing the, the new iPhone 7 Plus with dual cameras, which you can start to do some really interesting things just with that. But with their acquisition of PrimeSense and Mateo, we know that there's more coming. Project Alloy uh, was announced by Intel. It's a prototype now, but it's an inside-out tracking headset where you, using RealSense, you can track someone's hands, but also integrate, like in this case, a dollar bill into the virtual experience so that you can have real objects interacting with virtual objects. Oculus last week announced the Santa Cruz prototype Again, an inside-out tracking all-in-one headset, and that headset um, uh, is like an Oculus Rift, but is, allows you to move around a, a physical space without any tethers, and they also demonstrated some social things that you can do with that, integrating video, internet feeds, and being able to interact with other people in real and virtual spaces. I'm also curious to see what HTC is going to do. They really recently announced that they're working with Natero, in order to get rid of the cable that, is, uh, that we're all tripping over when we're using our Vives. There's also a camera in the uh, HTC Vive, only a single one, but it's a step towards that direction of being able to have more mixed reality. Now what we all want is a lightweight pair of glasses that does all of the things that Magic Leap uh, plans to do, and we hope that that will be coming soon, perhaps 2017. 
But until then, we can start developing with HoloLens and, and Tango and start figuring out what works best in these spaces and creating entertainment and, uh, and other more practical applications uh, for people right now, which is uh, what makes me excited to be here. And I'm really grateful to uh, having the time to share some of these experiences with you. So thank you.